driveway where we have a couple of our cars, and we'll just mill around and talk and share more stories. But until then, take care. Thank you. First of all, let me tell you how much we appreciate you inviting us. And this is, is meant to be just a story of an adventure. Okay? And so first of all, let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you have ever seen that taxi cab? I see it. You can go ahead and raise your hand if you have, <laughs> but I mean, okay? And how many of you here are part of Cal Poly Racing today? Well, let me, let me just start. My name is Dennis Reaver. And I, I'd first like to introduce, we have our degree here and stuff, but I'd first like to let you know where we're coming from and where these people live. So, Dave Mardine from L.A. We're joined by Lee Follinsby from Temecula. Chuck Raggio from Linden, California. We left somebody in California to say we were locally represented. Roy Snover from Nashville, Tennessee. Jeff Hendricks from Arizona. Prescott, Prescott Arizona. And John Vorderbruggen from the Baltimore area. So some of these people have come in a long distance, and, and some of us have seen each other over the years, and some of us haven't. So some of us are getting together for the first time in just 48 years. And so um, let me start um, by saying, again, this is meant to be just a lighthearted story of an adventure. Times were much different. We took a tour of your shop up at the Arrow Hangar, and you guys have much more impressive tools than we have. Again, a mutual interest. Um, and we're going to pass the podium today, and so we're just going to pass it around and kind of share the presentation as we go through the slide and kind of share it among us. Um, let me start the story because it, to me it's like, where did the Baja concept get started? Where was the beginning? So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I came to Poly in the fall of 1969. And I was roomed with a young gentleman named Alan Goldman, who was also a mechanical engineer, and who became a very good friend, a member of SAE. And in the second year that I was rooming with Alan, we were in a conversation, and Alan was telling me the excitement and the friends he had made in being part of your Rosewood committee. And he would become engaged to a girl named Joni of the Rose Float Committee, and he also pointed out that the Rose Float Committee, committee had a lot more girls in it than it. Anyway, he became a close friend, and in the second year, we were having a conversation, and one of us was on the couch, and one of us was in a beanbag chair, and beanbag chair was a big friend. And the conversation where he was sharing the <coughs> friends he had made and the fun he had had with Rose Float, I was complaining to him because our sister school at Cal Poly Pomona was racing a car in the Baja 500, and we weren't. And the result of that conversation was simply Alan saying to me, quit your complaining, get off your house, and go get something started. That's where our story starts. Okay? So in, in the early 71, I started a conversation with Cal Poly Pomona. Cal Poly Pomona had run their car in the Baja 500 in 70. Um, and they had used a taxi cab, a little older vintage than this one, but they had used one and in their first year suffered suspension failure within the first hundred months. Turned around, came home, and started talking about it next year. In 71, they had brought the same car back but they have corrected it. We'll, uh, we'll look at some of the changes they have made to their car. But they had, they had come back and run in 71. And they ran in 72. So this is our story. Our first race was in 1972, which was the fourth annual Baja 500. Baja and off-road racing was young, very young. And I will describe it more as a hobby sport than a professional race back in those days. Um, so they were racing in the stock two-wheel drive class in their 70. Their modifications threw them into modified two-wheel drive. We were racing in the stock two-wheel drive um, division. 
I started working with Pomona and getting their feelings as well as the Professional Society of Automotive Engineers out of Southern California and in California. The professionals at SAE said the way for us to get started in this was to go the taxi route. And the engineers, students from Pomona said, get a smaller car. Um, which we'll come to recognize that. And I think most of us knew it, but we were trying to get started. Um, by fall of 71, I had started looking to see if other students were perhaps interested in racing Baja. And the first few that I got in touch with were came to, to me and said, okay, where's the race car? Let's, let's go. And we had to share that there really isn't a car, really isn't a plan. We're just sharing a concept. And then we had a meeting that had a few more people at it and a little more excitement. And one of the people said, give me Double Cap's number, I'll get us a cab. And the next one says, I got a truck, I'll pull it up here. And the next one said, I'm not doing anything this weekend, I'll go with it. That's these guys. Um, and that's where it all started. This is kind of like the core team, if you will, from, from that year. By the fall of 71, we had the making of what I'll call a team. We had people with an interest and people that were excited about it. And we started getting a car, and I think we got our first cab, this beauty here, um, in, in the fall of, 9, of 71. And we all put on our best clothing for our photo here. And we started trying to build a car. Um, it wasn't until probably three months into 72. Now, we're going to race this car that we got in fall of 71, we're going to race that car on June 8th of 72. And so we went to the Student Affairs Council, and I don't know whether SAC is what you still call it or anything like that. But I'm saying we went to them and we asked for funding. And we asked them for $1,563.15. We had itemized the list of parts we needed down to main bearings, which cost $20.02. Pistons, which were $6.24 each. Spark plugs were a dollar each. And we were funded by them. And I will point out that we gave $418.44 back to them in change because we got a better response from donators than we thought. We so here we were, but let's get back <coughs> to the cool stuff. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jeff Henry. All we had to do at this point was, you know, build a car. And there was other options, but the taxi path, we kind of figured that Pomona had a good model, so we just kind of continued on that. And uh, like you said, we got we got the first one, and for, after about 100,000 miles or more, these things were pretty well shot. You could sit in the seat, and uh, mm -hmm. All you felt were springs, and we brought it back, and as you can see, proceeded to strip it down. We had the body clear off, the frame was exposed, we didn't even end up using that engine, and uh, doors were, we cut out the inside of the doors trying to save weight, uh, but like he said, in, the, in those early days, this was a hobby racers. Some big names, Malcolm Smith, James Garner, Mickey Thompson, Arnelli Jones, I don't know, some of those names are probably familiar to you. Um, but it was a, uh, a project that we started not really knowing what we were doing. And we didn't have any overall plan other than the June 8th, we were going to start the, the Baja 500. We didn't have an advisor really that I could No, we didn't. It was, it was pretty much, there were a lot of other guys as, as that previous picture. Can you go back? This is, 
probably the majority of the guys that did most of the work, but there were probably two or three times as many people that we had SAE ultimately was 25 people. Yeah. Ultimately, there was a lot of people that worked on this. We even had some some uh, guys from the electrical engineering right. department, and uh, so it was a it was a project that we started. Next one. Dick Hickey is probably a name that not very many people know, but he was a prolific off-road designer at the time. Builder, built military vehicles, built off-road racing cars, uh, all kinds of things. He was he was at Cal Poly, and I'm not sure where he was at the time, but he was he was in this area still, and. He, he talked to us, kind of guided us in some directions, and uh, was a big help. Next. This, this is him. This is his vehicle. Uh, some other big names that were, that were racing at that time, but it was not a, it was not a professional. Um, thing to the <laughs> level that they lowered the ball joints down on the frame to get the car up in here. So what we did on the, <coughs> on the upper control arm, there we go, find the, button. the upper control arm, uh, wishbone as they call it, we, we basically cut the ball joint mount off of it and we added plates and we dropped the ball joint down three inches. So we raised the car three inches. And then you see the side gusset, those are angle beam, angle iron, and we ran the side gussets. And uh, that's how we got the top ball joint down. And then you'll see in the picture, we, that's a shock absorber. And we put the shock tower in, and we had extra long throw shock absorbers for the extra travel that we might get. Uh, <laughs> by the lower, by the, and here's another shot you can see. Get the head out of the way from the back here. Uh, you can see the ball joint is now sitting at least three inches lower. And you can see how it stiffened and you can see the shock tip. And that shifted it because it originally came across and the ball joint was up high. So we flipped it 180 degrees, put in a, a connector plate, a vertical connector plate, welded it all back together. We added some cross gussets across because that was an open piece of just pressed metal for the lower control arm. So we stiffened that up. And that's how we got the bottom ball joint to be three inches lower. So that's how we raised the front of the car. And then the other thing we did was tie rods, stock tie rods, that coupler on a stock tie rod, the manufacturers take a flat plate, they roll it around, there's about a quarter inch gap in that plate, and it's a fairly thick plate so they can, work, they can cut threads in it on the ends. And they just put almost, you could call it a hose clamp, but it's obviously stiffer on both ends. And that's a stock tie rod adjuster for your toe end and stuff like that. So one of our one of the guys machined a solid bar, left hand, right hand threads in it, and that gave us the strength of our tie rod. Uh, it, it, it strengthened it up. We also added some gussets in it, which you don't see in that picture. And we'll show you the tie rod a little later as well. On the rear end of the car, to gain our roughly three inches, we put much bigger springs on it, and we put airbags inside the springs. That's how we got our height on the rear. And the pan hard bar, what a hand hard bar is. It, it keeps it keeps the rear end a, the, the rear end it keeps it under the car and it doesn't let it go sideways. And in fact, there were some cars in the old days that General Motors made that didn't have very good stability on that. And you could see the rear end wobble when they hit the brakes, like big Cadillacs and Buicks. But that hand hard bar is just a, a diagonal bar that goes across, attaches to the rear end assembly. You know, Okay, and we had in, in the first year we only used one rear shock. We discovered pictures last night that we have two shocks on the rear end, so we're not sure when we did it. Um, anyway, and then that's a that's just a wire wire rope strap with, with a uh, rope clamp, and that was done for a look for a odd mountain limit. So the car was flying in the air, and we want to stop it from moving. So you want to ask a question? Yeah. Go for it. When did you guys get the like air shock off? Of? Oh, air, yeah, the airbags. Oh, 
the airbags up, in, up inside the uh, inside the spring. Yeah. Roy, you're the. I've got somebody to give them to us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and those were made specifically for for putting inside spring, and that's it may very well be those were. For, I, don't, I don't remember the manufacturer. In testing, we had a rock had lodged in between the spring and the airbag and punctured the first one. Um, and we had to replace it, I remember that, but I don't remember the name of the company. I don't think there was anybody that was modern. Um, but yeah, out of LA, out of LA, I don't know. It, it was, was uh, uh, Airlift. Airlift was the name of the airbag. Okay. And that's the company. And uh, actually, they still exist. I think they were bought out by uh, the Holly Industry. Is that, that's not what we The engine, basically, the drive came together. How many of you in here are on the power side? Engines and whatever. Okay. How many of you own Mustangs? Nobody has a Mustang? There's one guy. Wow. Okay. So my first car was a 65 Mustang, 6 cylinder, 200 cc. It may have had a three speed automatic. I don't know. And I tried to make a hot line of this car. And so I'm going through all the magazines and all that. They come across a guy by the name of Ag Miller, who we'll talk about a little bit more. And he knew how to hot rod six-cylinder Mustangs. And basically, you take the 200 out and put in a 300cc truck engine, which had a heck of a lot of torque. So we started on that. So again, we basically had five months to put this together. And the highlight of the car, I have to do that. Oh, it's right here. Red button. Oh. Okay. So we had two separate and individual uh, electrical systems here that the uh, electric double E's and EL's came up with. And that fancy control panel is outside the cockpit. Uh, that, was, that was all there. And then in our, you know, with the limited time, went to a fuel tank up inside the trunk, all right, which we'll find out later. We're probably not the best place to put it. And our spares package in here. Uh, let's go to the uh, next slide. So, to beef this up, you know, this was an Offenhauser map. This is all the stuff that I got to see when I was reading these magazines, you know, I couldn't write it myself. But hey, we're doing this at the school and it's getting donated. So, uh, hydraulic lifters, Holly Four Barrel here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Points and condensers? <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad they are here. This is all before electronics. So, uh, the. The ignition system was hardly electronic. It was run by a set of points that opened and closed to the distributor, off of a little cam, and those build up this, the energy in the coil that then shoots it over to the uh, respective spark plug. That's all we're going to go on that one. Uh, but we boarded up to uh, 302 cubic inches. Cars on the road, trucks on the road. But these children were paying in the middle of the street far away, and so we had a discussion and we thought, well, we probably should show down, slow down a little bit. But as we got closer, the children all scattered and clearly got out of our way. And then we noticed that there was a large ridge across the road. And we thought, well, the best thing to do would be put the hammer down and take it light in the front end and see what that was. <laughs> the game was you would take four to six inch round rocks and put them across the road and then pack dirt against them so we couldn't tell what they were. So the result was you just heard the rocks bouncing off the bottom of the car and made sure everything was still there and kept going. But that was the excitement of this thing and you, you didn't know what was around the next corner, so to speak. Um, with that, we continued on from Camelou and headed to El Rosario. Um, we had this was now getting into the dirt and the back, and I think our run through there, I guess, was pretty clean. Um, another attribute of the race course is this is not a race course where there's a little red arrow at each road that says turn here, or turn there. And an attribute was the road would very commonly split in two or three different roads. And sometimes that meant that 50 feet down there was an arroyo. So an arroyo is simply a water wash where the flood waters come through. And this road in the middle would go off the edge of the arroyo this way. And this one would go off the arroyo this way. 
And this one would go to the town over there. <laughs> and so this was an adventure and, and certainly an experience to us. We arrived at El Rosario, I forget the time, but night had set in, and we were going great. Sir Jay.
It took us a few minutes to figure out whether we were going to unstrap from the seat belts or just stay intact for a little longer to see whether the ride was actually over. Um, at which point we decided I unstrapped mine and climbed out the driver's window. The car was fairly secure. Chuck unstrapped, came out through the driver's window. And you'll see later in the movie clip, as we were waiting to be rescued, we actually started taking external things like the lights and stuff off the car in case we'd lost it down the side. We would have done about three rolls before it fell off the, the ledge, but that was the end for our year. Okay. Here, here, go ahead. I want to make one engineering point here on this. So in addition to the engine, I welded up the roll gauge. And I'm sitting on the side because we don't know. Chuck is actually driving as, he, as we went over that bar. And a second later, there was about 50 yards of dirt that came over the front of the car. <laughs> we decided that that car probably wouldn't survive. And we abandoned it, packed up, and went home. So that was the end of the Baja 500 uh, race. So that last slide. Yeah, you have yeah, the, last, yeah the, last, the last ride. Okay. There's, there, you take it from here. All right. So, it says final ride. Man. Can, I, can you start going now? Okay. Maybe. Okay. This is it. There we go. So, was this the end? Not so fast. <laughs> this is the uh, Mustang Daily, and I'm standing next to the car, and it says, sad end to a race car. All right? Well, I'll tell you what the deal was. At the end of 73, we all come back. It's June, we're ready to go home. Some people are graduating. And uh, Dennis Michael and I and John actually lived in this off-campus dorm called Tropicana. It's now a senior home. <laughs> Dennis may be willing to go back there. <laughs> so anyway, um, Dennis, big tall Dennis, he puts his hands on my shoulders like this as he's walking away, and he said, I said, Dennis, I looked at the cat, it hurt, hurt pretty hard. And he said, you SAE guys need a new race car. I don't know whether that car is another taxi or it's something else, but you need a new race car. He then got on his big 750 Honda extended forks, and I did not see Dennis for 50 years. Up until last night, we drank beer together. <laughs> but I was a freshman. Dennis was a graduating senior. And I respected him because I saw his leadership and what he was doing, and what really this group of guys, this group of eight guys was, was really doing. And it was amazing to me. So I thought, OK, we need a new race car. So. Over the course of the next six months, the balance of that year, I visited Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Nissan, Toyota, it wasn't Nissan, it was Datsun. And I asked them all, could you please donate a vehicle to us and some parts so we could continue our Baja operation? No. So, that was a little bit disheartening. Also, Jeff Hendricks and I, we looked at every other option. We were looking at old Ford trucks and anything we could turn in because we had the facility. We had a new dynamometer. We had all kinds of things in the old ME mechanical engineering lab. We needed something. And I, I didn't know what to do. Next slide. So I worked for a gentleman. And this is very significant to SAE. I worked for this gentleman, Bob Estes. And Bob Estes was a real car guy. He owned five dealerships. He owned a Lincoln Mercury dealer in Inglewood, California. I graduated from Inglewood High School. My dad was a captain on the Inglewood Fire Department. So anyway, but also, he 
ran Indianapolis from 1946 to 1961 as an owner. It's one of his Indy Roadsters here. He uh, also ran a number of champ cars and sprint cars. You know what the difference between a champ car and a sprint car is? It exists today. Same car. Sprint car is 88 inch wheelbase, short tracks, half miles. Champ car is one mile and more. 96 inch wheelbase. Same car otherwise. And, uh, <clears throat> but what he did that was very relevant to us was Lincoln in 1953 and 1954 came out with a new engine, the wide block V8. You have no idea what that is. And replaced the flathead Ford. Okay, this was a big deal. Chevrolet did not have a V8 at that time. 1955. So what Bob Estes wanted to do was he wanted to compete in this race, and this race was called the La Carrera Panamericana Mexican Road Race. And he had a very good friend by the name of Bill Strong, who was in Long Beach, Signal Hill, not far from, from England. And so what they did is they got Ford backing, and they prepared these Lincolns to run the Mexican road race. Again, the La Carrera. So when you see a Porsche Carrera today, all the manufacturers came with their best stuff. Porsche came out with a special car for this race called the Carrera, it's a 356, little bathtub looking car. It was a four cams, best stuff they had. Ferrari was there with the best stuff they had. The Lincolns cleaned their car. And so this was a big deal. And they did it two years in a row and then they stopped the race. So he had a feeling for Mexico, but he also had a very strong relationship with the Ford Motor Company. So I asked him, I said, Mr. Estes, would you please talk to the Ford Motor Company? Because they told me no. And he said, yes, I will do that for you. And he was a mentor in my life. He said, but I think you're on the wrong track. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're asking for, find another taxi cab. You want a 428 Cobra jet in it this time rather than the six cylinder. And he said, this is 1974. Next year, catalytic converters will be equipped on all the cars. He was also the president of the National Automobile Dealers Association. He was in Washington, D.C. all the time. Big guy. And so he said, you're looking in the rearview mirror. And maybe that's why all these people said no to you. You need to think of an approach that helps this industry. A 428 is called an FE engine. That's Ford Edson. That's how old it goes back. He goes, we don't even, they don't build that engine anymore. Now they're the 300 series, the 429s, and the 460s, emissions-based engines. You need to do what you want, but you need to look ahead, not in rear view mirror. So, Next one. We got together as a group here at Society of Automotive Engineers, and now we have a new theme. Society of Automotive Engineers, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, clean air off-road racing. How about that? <laughs> so now we are looking forward. We don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> but it sure as hell sounds good. Cool. So, <clears throat> I go back and I visit all those same manufacturers that I mentioned before. And they were much more enthused about it. And they treated me well, and they all said no. With the exception of Toyota. Toyota, Torrance, California, headquarters, they said, you know something? You know, we slammed the door on you here a few months ago. We like this idea. And you say you've got a dynamometer 
a new dynamometer up at uh, Cal Poly, and you've got a lab, and uh, we know you have this, this other race car, this taxi. Um, we want to come up and see it. But a couple weeks later, they show up team from Torrance, Toyota Torrance. Jeff Hendricks and I take them out to dinner. Beautiful San Luis Obispo. They look at what we have. I had the engine on the, uh, from the taxi on the dynamometer to kind of show them how it all worked. And uh, a long story short, as they left, he said, uh, David, I like this. I like this opportunity. I want to talk to you more about this. I'll call you in a week. He did. Called me in a week and said, you come to Torrance and lay this out. How's this going to work? So, I went to Torrance. And he said, you know, again, we want to do this with you. Next one. So, I've, cleaned, I've redacted this. <laughs> This is Scout's Honor verbatim. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this guy's name was uh, Chuck Burlingame, and uh, he liked to be called Mr. B. All right? And so I, I show up at Torrance, and uh, <clears throat> I go in there and I said, that, You know, I'm here. I want to thank you for agreeing to provide the truck and the parts and all these things and my list, which I happen to have here in triplicate. And he said, well, how are you going to do this? I said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have two teams. We are going to have a team for the taxi, and we're going to have a team for the Toyota. And, of course, the Toyota will be our priority, but we're out getting, we want to get a new taxi. And so he says to me, I told you, there's going to be no parts, no money, no truck, no nothing, if that damn taxi is anywhere near the San Luis Obispo operation. That is key. He did not say Cal Poly. He said the San Luis Obispo operation. So I was a little taken back by this. And I said, but Mr. B, Everybody loves the taxi. The school loves it. The SAE loves it. The fans love the taxi. Who wouldn't love the taxi? Just come. Nordine, you don't effing get it. The effing taxi is out of here. People love it. That's the issue. They will never love a Toyota if that effing taxi exists. <laughs> Bring me proof that that effing taxi is gone, and then go see Randy Dorton and go pick up your parts and your engines. Randy Dorton, you remember that name? It's going to come up. So, two weeks later, remember sat into a race car, the picture, Mustang Daily? I walk in and I show them that picture. I'm not very happy. And I said, it was uh, <clears throat> a Friday afternoon about 3 o'clock. Left Cal Poly early, got down to LA, going to his office. I said, there it is. Proof the tax is dead. I cut it in half with a torch myself. And you saw the picture. <clears throat> And of course, I said, now, can I go see Randy Dorton and get my parts and pieces that we need for the team? And he said, yes. He said, you're, you're a little upset. I said, well. He said, uh, do you drink? I said, no, sir, I'm not. I'm not 21. And he said, well, it's Friday afternoon. It's about 4 o'clock now. Do you mind if I have a drink? I said, sir, this is your office. You can do anything you want. He said, go back in that cabinet. There's a bottle of blood leather back there. And a, and a two-shot glass. Poor little guy. 
I give it to him. We have a little discussion, and he's trying to calm me down and make me feel a little better about cutting the taxi down at his request. And I said, you know, at five o'clock, I gotta go see Randy before five o'clock. It's Friday. I, I gotta give him my grocery list of parts and pieces. He said, Randy can wait. He calls his secretary and says, Tell Randy we'll be there when we're there. <laughs> at seven o'clock, Randy comes walking into the office. He has consumed most of his fall. <laughs> and if you know where Torrance, California is, Palos Verdes, which is where he lived, is about 15 minutes up the hill. And Randy and I took him home. I got home about 8.30 that night, and I called my old boss, Bob Estes. And he said, how did it go? I said, can I have breakfast with you tomorrow? He said, sure, come on up. So I went up to see him, 1835 West Ridge Road, Pacific Palisades. Big guy. And he goes, hey, what happened? I said, the Toyota project they want to do, we're all in. The taxi is dead. He just you know, cut it in half with a torch. I'm really upset about it. And he said, you know something? I understand. I understand completely. Because they have something planned here. And they are not going to share one square inch of floor space with Ford. And I said, I'm not Ford, I'm Cal Poly. He said, no, that's a Ford. Trust me, they realize that's a Ford. They're not going to share one bit of space with Ford or any kind of sponsorship with Ford. So you need to understand that. And he said, now, let me complicate your life. Now this is my mentor, for God's sakes. Next slide. Ford finally donates the 428 Cobra Jet, a C6 transmission, the Najibar Iron NASCAR center section differential, and a brand new 300,000 mile 1968 Texas. I said, I don't believe this. Two weeks ago, we had nothing. nothing. Now we have everything. And he goes, you're right, you do. And all this is going to get delivered to the Lincoln Mercury dealership. And it can't stay there. And you need to move forward with this Toyota program. He said, I'm telling you, that's the future. This is nostalgia. So what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, let me call Bill Strzok. Again, these guys are old friends. He goes, maybe he has an idea. Next slide. So a week later, he calls me and he says, um, yeah. He said, you need to call this guy Rod Hall. Well, Rod Hall is a big off-road race guy based out of Reno, Nevada. And uh, so I did. I called Rod Hall. And he said, well, I've talked to Bob Estes. I've talked to Bill Strop. I understand you've got some new parts and pieces. And his business is he converts passenger cars into off-road cars. That's what he does. And he's an age-old off-road expert. This is his Bronco which he won the 1969 Baja 1000, that car, it was recently restored. And it's the only four-wheel drive that has ever won an overall Nora or score race, overall, against the bikes and all that, all two-wheel drives beyond this. And so anyway, he says, I have a customer that I need to build a car for that had a relationship with Oswald. And that has fallen apart. So he wants a car and it needs to be a Ford. So I will send a truck down and I will pick up all the parts in Inglewood and 
on any parts that you have in San Luis Obispo, and I'll take them to Reno. I said, okay. He goes, and I'm going to give you a check of $2,500 for all of these as a donation to the SAE project. <coughs> so, you know, that's about $15,000 today. So I said, okay. Now, what kind of choice do I have? About four or five months later, Rod Hall called me. I'm here at San Luis Obispo. And uh, we're going crazy with this Toyota project and trying to get things moving. And he says, uh, Nordine, if you're available a week from Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning, why don't you come up to Rod Hall Raceway? I said, uh, where's Rod Hall Raceway? He goes, just east of Reno. Do you know where the Mustang Ranch is? I said, I've heard of the Mustang Ranch, but I've never been there. And he said, well, off of I-80, three-eighths of a mile off the road, gives me directions. He said, come on up. I have something I want you to see. So I said, oh, is it the taxi? And he goes, I'm not going to talk about it. You're either going to be here at 9 o'clock on Friday or you're not. So I call Randy Dorton. Now, Randy Dorton has an internship. He went to Kiefer University, or Pfeiffer University, sorry, just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Randy Dorton is exactly my age, exactly my grade. And again, he has a one-year internship at Toyota. He is an engine guy. He's a NASCAR guy. He worked for a guy by the name of Harry Hyde. Harry Hyde, if you Google him, was a NASCAR crew chief and engine builder. And he worked for this guy kind of like I worked for Bob S. And so, he's there at Toyota. He knows what the deal is. And he, so I call his brand, I don't know what to do, but we, we got to see this car. He goes, we can't. If we do this, he goes, I'm telling you, Toyota will pull everything out of Cal Poly. The SAE will have nothing. You've already sold the car. You're going to be at zero one more time. He goes, you can't do it. It's just too risky. Somebody will find out. And he looked at me and he goes, we're going to Reno, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I said, you're damn right. So we go to Reno. Nine o'clock in the morning, we're there. And there's a taxi. It's not our taxi. It's a 68 taxi, kind of stretched over a chromoly tube frame. 428 is there, the drivetrain. And this is a full race car. It's got disc brakes. It's got a foot of travel. We probably had, I don't know, what, down to six inches of travel in the taxi? Something like that. This had 20. It has Baja runners, big tires on it. This is a beautiful car. Well, it's a taxi. <laughs> so he says, uh, what do you think? I said, I don't. He goes, get in this thing. Let me show you how to start this. We get in it, Randy and I get in this car, and they had a track. And, and that track, Ron Hall Raceway, is there today. It's actually a beautiful facility today. It's uh, about a mile and a half track, and it's switchbacks cut in the side of a mountain on the north side of I 80. So you can make the track anything you want. So we take the thing through, we drive it, that drives great. And uh, it's got 400 plus horsepower, it's, it's what we want. And uh, Randy says to Rod Hall, can we take it out on I-8? He goes, what, you guys want to see how fast it'll go? Like, yeah, absolutely. He goes, go ahead. So we take that thing on I-8, there's nobody out in the desert like that. We run, this thing run 130, 135 miles an hour. We bring it back, and they had little, it was a test and tune day, maybe a dozen cars there of, of different sizes and types. And so we got to play with that taxi. And the taxi lived another day. He was going to rebody that car. I think he was going to put a Torino body on it or, or something like that. 
But that was Rod Hall's little contribution to our taxi. And that was the end of the taxi. Taxi emotionally did live another day. Next one. Okay. Back to Toyota. So, Toyota is happier than hell, and uh, they call and say, okay, you need to come down to Long Beach, where they have a big warehouse, and they had cars down there. They said, we're going to give you two cars. Come down here, what do you want? So they have short beds and long beds, which is nine inch longer wheelbarrows. And so they have, you know, we're going to get two. And I said, well, we want the long wheelbase. I said, what are these two things? And he says, well, those are campers. It's something that we did when the long wheelbase came out. We wanted to approach this market of the RV little camper in this Chinook company made these little fiberglass campers. The trucks have a slightly reinforced frame, and they have no back panel where the rear glasses is a walkthrough. So I said, what about these two? He goes, one has a VIN number, and one does not. One's strictly a show car. It can never be registered. And I said, can we have these? And he goes, that looks like a race car to you? I go, no. It looks like money to me. He goes, well, what are your plans? And I said, well, we're going to sell this one that has a VIN number. And Randy had kind of told me this, so we did a little homework, Jeff Hendricks and I. And we sold these to El Monte Rental, and they rent motorhomes and trailers. $2,500, magic number for us again. So we sold the complete VIN truck for $2,500. <clears throat> Jeff and I went down with his van and towed a 100 Dodge van, and we towed this one back. Next one. So I'm not going to get into a long, laborious thing, but we constructed this car. And we had all the parts and pieces we needed. If we needed an extra frame, an extra bed, anything we wanted, we got. There was not an issue of having two cars. We could get anything. We needed the $2,500. So, blue frame. Did I hear about a blue frame before? <laughs> so, we reinforced this frame a little bit more in blue in honor of the taxi. <laughs> and, of course, you see, here we are. And here's the bed on the truck. We had to extend the fender wells right here, as you see. We added another piece because the tires were so much bigger and more traveled. Also, to do the same thing, we had to cut the floors in the, in the floor of the truck for the front because of the travel and the size of the tires. And you see how all of this is together. This is a beautiful race car. There's two things I really want you to understand. The taxi still Remember that electrical panel that uh, I think John or Dennis talked about, or maybe Roy? There it is. Sat between the seats of the taxi. The Toyota had a seven and a quarter inch ring and pinion here. And not that this developed a tremendous amount of power to break it, but when the car would get airborne and come down, it was very difficult on the small ring and pinion here. And the materials were not great at that time in, in the, the Japanese gears. And so we replaced it. We had the 9-inch Ford axle from the taxi. We narrowed it. We put cook axles in it. We put a nodular center section in it, NASCAR style. We never had a problem. You notice the dual shocks, S-A-E, right there on good American. <laughs> Next one. This is important, and this is why Toyota developed a relationship with this. This was the birth of TRD, Toyota Racing Development, right here, San Luis Obispo. So, we talk, we talk about our clean air off-road racing program, right? You saw the shirt. 
And these are crate engines, and we got a number of these, 18 RCs, 20 RCs, 22 RCs. We had all of these engines, and here was our dynamometer, a little go-power water brake dynamometer that we ran. And notice all the scatter shields on this. There are none. <laughs> Again, my buddy Randy Dorton, we are blowing these engines up on a dynamometer. <laughs> Throwing rods out the side, all over the lab. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But we finally got this done, and we worked with Toyota, their engineers, and we developed for our clean air off road racing program an ultra high compression engine, about 13 to 1. And it used special pistons made by Vanolia in Long Beach. And the pistons had a, a compression wedge on them, but it created a vortex. So on the compression stroke, it would mix the air-fuel mixture tremendously, and then we used an MSD-style ignition. With 13 to 1 compression, we're burning hydrocarbons. At least, that's what we told the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And so in order to handle the compression, we had an O-ring in the block. You can see a little O-ring there. So we had a copper O-ring to handle this compression. We had a special head that was a, a Jap Japan only head, not a USA head. And we had different rods that we used with these pistons. And, uh, and we ran this and stock this engine, we ran these engines stock, about 75 horsepower SAE net, running water pump, alternator, exhaust system, and all that. This engine, with the stock intake manifold and carburetor, would put out about 125, and that's what all of the Class 7 mini trucks, it was our class, put out about that. If they were, you know, in race trim, about 125, 75 to about 100, 125 horsepower. So we were right there in line. Randy and I, it's what Saturday afternoon, I'll never forget it. We're running this thing on the dyno. We have several camshafts. It's a single overhead cam. It's easy to change the camshafts. And we're changing cams, trying to get the last little bit of power or torque out of it. And Randy Dorton says to me, and he's an engineer, he's an NASCAR thinking guy. And he said, this thing is dying for more carburation. And I said, well, Randy, the spec says we have to use this intake manifold, and we have to use production carburetor. He goes, oh. In NASCAR, production carburetor means anything we damn well want it to. <laughs> he goes, do you have any carburetors around here? And I said, well, whenever we go to look for parts, we go out in the yard behind the ME lab, and it's where the state trucks their maintenance pool is. <laughs> I swear to you, this is the truth. <laughs> There's a two and a half ton Dodge state bed truck. <laughs> And it has a 440 cubic inch truck engine with a two barrel carburetor. Randy goes, ah. We pull, Saturday afternoon, we pull the carburetor off of the truck. We measure it, and it's almost 400 CFM cubic feet per minute. The Toyota was 135. Randy says, oh. I go, Randy, it's not going to fit. We don't have He goes, Get me a block of aluminum and let me at the bridge port. <laughs> he was an expert machinist, I must tell you. In two hours, we had a perfect little adapter, about this tall, that adapted the <coughs> poly two barrel off of the Chrysler engine to this manifold. We put it on, we didn't rejet it or anything, 150 horsepower. That evening, jumped 25 horsepower. Significant. 20% just like that. And he goes, oh, let's solder up the jets and then re-drill them because it's running too lean or too rich, whatever it was. So we got this thing and it was now putting out and we changed cams again that night. We got this thing up 15560 horsepower. All of our competitors were about 125 because Randy interpreted, went to the Harry Hyde School of Specification reading. <laughs> production carburetor. He goes, you can buy that carburetor now. That's production carburetor. <laughs> so, that's what we did. The next one. Randy Dorton.
Okay. <coughs> Randy Jordan was very instrumental, as was Rod Hall, as was Bob Estes, to Cal Poly's SAE program. Randy, smart guy, Emmy, he graduates and he goes to work for Robert Gates. Robert Gates built Ford engines and was an owner of a Ford race car. Larry McReynolds does a lot of color on NASCAR today. Larry McReynolds was his crew chief. And Davey Allison, name you don't know, was the driver of that car. Um, he worked for them for a while. And then he went to start his own company called Competition Engines. Competition Engines was soon acquired by Rick Hendrick, Hendrick Motorsports. Who's heard of Hendrick Motorsports? It's the largest name in NASCAR. All right. And what Rick Hendrick wanted to do was he wanted to he wanted Randy to create the engine program where all General Motors cars lease engines from Hendrick Motorsports, and that's exactly how it is today. Every General Motors car that races has a Hendrick leased engine. Every Ford that races today has a Roush Yates, Jack Roush, and Robert Yates' son, Doug Yates. Roush Yates, Ford, the other is GM. And Randy built that whole business. All of Jeff Gordon's Championships, Randy Dorton engines. Bobby Labonte in 2001, Jimmy Johnson, the first few of his championships, all with Randy Dorton. So, Randy and I remain good friends. Every time they're on the West Coast, we, we got married about the same time, our sons are about the same age. Every time I was back east, I'd go to Charlotte and I'd see Randy saying he would come back out here. We'd talk about the taxi, what we were getting away with. So I'm an NASCAR fan. Sunday morning, Martinsville race, half mile track. I'm watching it, news flash on TV. The Hendricks King Air flies into Martinsville Speedway. Foggy morning, and they put it into the side of the mountain. So on board, Rick Hendrick's son, Ricky Hendrick, um, Rick Hendrick's brother on that plane, Randy Dorton, Tony Stewart's pilot, several other people, obviously the pilot, but they're all dead. Oh my God. And I know his wife, I know his kids. So anyway, I went back to his funeral. And uh, next one. Finished race car. This was a beautiful car. Absolutely stunning race car. Here's our group. We had a guy, Ken Kittleson, who was a body paint guy. This thing, school colors, green and gold. Cal Poly sticker on the window. This thing was gorgeous. This was a real gorgeous race car. And uh, every race, you know, in an off-road race or a test, you destroy it. They come back with every race, this car will um, Next slide. And it ran. So it ran for, uh, for actually three years before it was replaced by the next generation. And only one, I won't, I won't belabor this, but you can see some action shots here of the Toyota. This is the first Baja 500 in June of 75. And what they did, they reversed the course, and we started in Ensenada, two miles on asphalt, and then on the dirt to Ojos Negros, which used to be the last stop. Well, now it's the first. And Jeff and I are in the car. Drag race stop, side by side. Flagman waves us off. Who pulls up next to us is this guy, Dick Landfield. He runs the factory Ford, and he is our class leader. So when we had questions about the car, we would ask Dick Landfield. Okay. 
okay, the factory Ford car. And he had the best engine, the best everything, he thought. So, again, we take off, this guy burns rubber, we don't just don't do that, so I don't, we ease the thing off. We immediately catch up to uh, Dick Landfield, and he's over there, and he's shifting gears. I thought he gave me the one finger salute. I said, Jeff, did you see that? He goes, don't get excited. So we used our horsepower advantage. <laughs> and so at the end of the two miles, we were about a quarter of a mile ahead of him. Mm. And that did cause some controversy later on that summer. But I won't get into that. It's sidebar later on. But uh, this thing ran pretty hard. Next one. So based upon this, we got... Cal Poly SAE, a ton of publicity. This is a beautiful car. It ran well, well built. Again, it's the next generation of the platform that these gentlemen started. So here's Off Road Magazine and their expose of the AC Delco Baja 500. And there's our truck right in the middle of that. Los Angeles Times sports section, read by millions of people all over the world. This is the Thursday, the biggest sports day of the year. Students get their test in Baja. This is all about Cal Poly SAE and what we're doing. And clean air off of the race. <laughs> all right. SAE National in Warrendale, Pennsylvania. They're going, what in the hell is going on out in San Luis Obispo? What are these guys doing? We're seeing all this stuff. This is amazing. All of the local papers, the Tri-County, you know, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, San Luis Obispo, we're in the paper all the time. Next one. So we're getting all this press. I am working at this gentleman by the name of Richard T. Combrink. He was our advisor. And he was a very nice man. He was about retirement age. And he was the nicest man on earth. He had no idea what we were doing. But he never got in our way. And I will tell you, I respect this man, and he knew kind of not to. Because, you know, we kind of did things a little bit because we had to. <laughs> and so, what, and I'm getting, I'm walking into the office now after the race and in the fall. Schools are, I get 10, 20 calls a week from different SAE chapters all over the country that said, hey, we just read about this in this magazine or this paper. We want to do it too. How do we do that? How do you build a car like that? That car, there's $30,000. That's $180,000 today. This was a serious machine. And so, you know, the SE southern section, northern section, come, how do you miniaturize this? Blah, blah, blah. We're getting all this. I get a note from... Dean Valdi. He is the Dean of the School of Engineering and Technology here at Cal Poly. He says, I got a note, he says, come see him. So I thought, oh, yeah, he's going to give us a pat on the back. So I go see Dr. Robert Valdi. I walk in, I go, Dean Valdi, what, what can I do? I understand you want to see him. And he goes, yes, I do. He said, uh, Congratulations to the SAE group. I said, would you like to speak to them? He goes, no. He said, I want to tell you, uh, this has gotten a lot bigger than what we ever thought. And you've got some issues here. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, the wind out of my sails. I said, what, what are the issues? He goes, well, there's a liability issue. you got Cal Poly all over this car. You're racing out of the country. There's a liability here. I mean, before it was kind of a, a novelty. This is no longer a novelty. This is serious. I go, yes, this is a serious proposition. He goes, you're working in the lab all hours of the day and night? There's women in that lab at night. I said, well, you know, we do have a couple of engineers, but there's also wives and girlfriends bringing us dinner. He goes, it's the optics. I'll never forget. It's the optics, Nordine. It's the optics. I said, oh. He goes, also, you're running up and down the airstrip. You're 100 miles an hour up there, whatever you're doing. No muffler, 
trucks, there's flames coming out of the car. <laughs> and there's dry weeds on there. You're going to catch up. Yeah, the fire department is not happy with the SAE. The police are less happy with the SAE. And he goes, and I'll tell you the worst ones, we moved the swine unit at the end of the airstrip because everybody complained about it. And they wanted to just be left alone. And so the swine unit is up there. And you're up there with your guy and all the guys, not me, the team, terrorizing the pigs. <laughs> He said, I'm going to just tell you, he goes, you know, you guys think this is funny, but you got problems. I'm not sure you're going to be able to continue to do this the way that you're doing it. I don't know that you're going to be able to continue with Cal Poly on the vehicle, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to do this on the Cal Poly campus. And I said, oh, God. And he goes, I said, so what do we do? And he goes, it's my job to help you. I said, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm getting much help here. I feel like, you know, you're cutting me off at the knees. And he goes, I'll help you, but the SAE needs to help me. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he goes, well, Cal Poly School of Engineering is the crown jewel of the California State University system. Absolutely the crown jewel. I was the Dean of Engineering at Cal State Fullerton. And everybody applied for the job when the San Luis Obispo job came up, the Cal Poly job. And I got that job. The School of Engineering in Fullerton, that's nothing. This is it. And I am having a seminar during Engineers Week with all the other school uh, deans for the School of Engineering at the Madonna Inn during Engineers Week. And you know, they're having a catapult contest for Engineers Week. I said, well, I will be sure to get the guys and we will go to the catapult contest. He goes, you damn right you will be there because you guys are going to build the catapult. I said, Dean Balpe, we don't know anything about <laughs> catapults and launching tennis balls. We, we do build things with wheels. And he said, no, 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 no. You used to build things with wheels. And I said, you know, I kind of feel like I'm being put in a corner. He goes, build the catapult. <laughs> Good day, Mr. Nordin. The meeting was over. So I go back to the guys, and I said, hey, you won't believe this. A long story short, we build the catapult, there is our trophy, right there on the floor. First, Society of Automotive Engineers. This is right outside the ME lab. Here's the ASME methane gas car, which I tried to get him to get the end. He goes, I don't want the ASME guys. I don't want the meth guys. The IE guys are worse. And, uh, you know, no, you guys are builders. So we did it, and we won. So on Monday, this is Thursday and Friday, we have the competition for the catapult. I mean, we wanted to do this like a whole lot. We have things to do. He calls me in the office on Monday. It's all over. We win the catapult. And he goes, Nardine, SAE, good job. I go, you want to come to the meeting and tell the guys this? He goes, no. Um, I said, what do, I, what do I tell the guys about the pigs? They're not happy, and the cops, and the fire department, and the liability. He goes, I've been working on that for you. Carry on. <laughs> Just carry on. I said, the pigs aren't squealing, you know? He said, I'll let you know. Carry on. This guy snookered me. <laughs> and, and he did a damn good job. Next slide. Okay, here it is, Mini Baja. So, we are getting, because of all the press we are getting, and we are getting press all over the country, it, this has become a huge, huge deal. And they said, put this, build a spec and put this thing in a box so that all the schools can do this if they choose to. So, this is our first, the first, Cal Poly SAE or SAE Mini Baja Racer. And it is 
red. Notice the, the number is 500. I don't know why they call it 500. But it, those are green and gold school colors. Honda donated, because there was a guy in the southern section, worked for Honda. And these are Honda 125 Elsinore engines with a little five-speed gearbox. And, that was, and everybody got the same power. And so, anyway, <clears throat> we built our car. And look at this. It's beautiful. Look at the construction on this thing. It's gorgeous. We wanted to have the competition here in San Luis Obispo because we love San Luis Obispo. The other schools don't like San Luis Obispo. No. So we did it at Indian Dunes, which is down in Valencia, California, near Magic Mountain. This was an off-road vehicle park. And once again, first place. All right? Just to show you real quick, this is UC Davis's car. This thing looks like a lawn tractor. <laughs> you know, and, and the Cal Poly Pomona, this is their car. It's red. It's supposed to be red. You know, Cal Poly had a lot of Baja experience. Pomona. And we expected something better than this. But you know, look at this machine. I can be proud of that. So anyway, that was the first Baja. Now the one you're really good at. Next one, please. Yes. What? <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. So, guys back east, MIT guys and, and Cornell University, they go, you know, we want to do the gravity car. So, because Akron, Ohio, home of the Soapbox Derby. And it's on that wide world of sports. This was an old sports program on ABC. And they did this, and, you know, and, and kids, kids built these Soapbox Derbies, and they had Soapbox Derby wheels. And they would go about three or 400 feet, and they'd go 20, 25 miles an hour at the end. So they said, we want to build a soapbox derby and a gravity-powered car. And we said, well, we don't want to compete with those because it will just be an extension. And who's better, Akron, Ohio, or SAE? We don't want that comparison. We have to build something better, a super soapbox. Let me tell you, look at this car. Once again, San Luis Obispo Engineering, Cal Poly, SAE, look at it. Independent suspension, green and gold, SAE, laid up fiberglass, and our racetrack. This is a half mile. This is the Grand Avenue entrance of Cal Poly. <laughs> and you come down, you can't do this now, but you come down this perimeter road, and right by the uh, gymnasium, and across the street from the old Emmy lab was exactly half a mile. <laughs> and that was our test track. And this car was going over 45 miles an hour. That'd be good All right? And it's a beautiful car. It's done so well, like we always do. And so now we're going to have big competition. So there's about eight schools that built super soap parks. So we go to the school, we say, okay, we want to have the competition, we're going to use Grand Avenue because it's got a corner in it to slow the cars down. The school came back and said, liability issue, you cannot do it, we're not going to close the streets down, you can't do it here. We said, God, we told everybody, and everybody's coming to San Luis Obispo. We went to Tank Farm Road. <laughs> we went to the city, and we said, we want to do this. The city was, no problem. <laughs> so, if you know Tank Farm Road on the southern side of town, there's a big long hill. We measure off a half a mile. Run these cars side by side. They're, this car is over 50 miles an hour in a straight line. And you can see it's a beautiful car. The other cars were much like what I showed you before on the Mini Maha. They were, did not have the integrity of this car. So about halfway, maybe two thirds of the way through our program, the other cars are falling over because they had no suspension. And on the rough asphalt, at maybe 30 or 40 miles, these cars are bouncing like crazy. You know, and we're gliding along. We all had the same wheels. We all used soapbox wheels. And so the SAE closed it down. They came to referee the event. They said, Shut this thing down because the people are on their sides, the cars are coming apart. This, this, this is a horrible idea. So, I thought you'd get a kick out of the super soapbox. Next. Formula SAE. 
So we have some formula SAE guys here, right? Yeah. All right. So again, we are getting all this this uh, attention, and we are being asked because we are like the motorsports guys, Cal Poly SAE, and the guys back east, they have line rock. University of Wisconsin has Road America. They want a race car. So they came to us and said, what do you think about a small car like this? Well, Chuck Raggio, where's Chuck? There's Chuck. Chuck graduates a couple years ahead of me, and he goes to work for Beck with Roy Snow. I think they shared a girlfriend there. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, I'm sorry. Chuck. Oh, good. I'm glad you got <laughs> But anyway, so these guys, and Chuck makes some money and he buys this Merlin. Oh, Lynn, good time. So Chuck buys this Merlin. And the Merlin, I've never seen a Formula Ford apart. I've never seen one naked before. Okay? So I went to Chuck, took me up to Sears Point, Sonoma where he was running this car. And I looked at this car and I could see it all. And I go, wow, this is really a simple, nice car. Disc brakes, coil over suspension, a 1600cc, maybe 110, 20 horsepower car, but muscle car fast. Muscle car fast. And I looked at that and I came back and I talked to the guys. And I said, maybe a version of this would be appropriate for Formula SAE. So I called a Honda guy, the guy that gave us the Elsinore engines for the mini model. And I said, think about this, Formula SAE, like Formula Ford, Raggio, you know, and they go, well, Formula SAE. So the, the Honda engine guy goes, yeah, that's a great idea. We make a 175 and a 250 version of this. And the 250 version is a six speed, that might be okay. So we created that spec for the first Formula SAE, right here at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. And oh, important, about, not about Chuck sharing the girlfriend with Rick, uh, with so. But this is Chuck's very first autograph signature to this little boy. <laughs> Very first time he did that. I remember him telling me that. And this is Tom Nelson, an SAE member, one of the best machinists you'll ever meet in your life, and a hell of a guy. Next slide. I say all of this today because these eight guys built a foundation. Regardless of how sophisticated the cab was or wasn't, that was a foundation. And that was the genesis of everything that we did after that. Yes, the Toyota was a better race car than the taxi. And the next Toyota after ours was better than the previous one. And the next one that came after that, Roger Mears drove it to win a win at Riverside. They got progressively better. Not because the members were any smarter, they weren't. They got to stand on the shoulders of the previous members' knowledge. They didn't have to start at ground zero. They had a firm foundation to stand on. And SAE and Cal Poly had that foundation. Why could we do all these other things? Why could we build a mini Baja that was awesome? And everybody else looked like a lawn track. I mean, it was the super soapbox. You saw 